This is the Math 217 lecture on advanced probability, including independence and tree diagrams. Uh, independence is a notion we've talked about before in the context of relating categorical variables. It's the same notion here. The language will seem a little bit different, and we will learn the using the language of probability will give us a more precise understanding of independence, but the idea, underlying idea is the same. In particular, Two events, A and B, are independent if knowing that one is true doesn't make the other more or less likely. That's quite close to the language of independence we used for variables, categorical variables. But the new thing is that symbolically, independence is equivalent to a statement about A and B. It's equivalent to saying that the probability of A and B is equal to the product of the probability of A times the probability of b. This is called the product rule. And the most important thing to remember it to remember about it is that it works only when a and b are independent. You can think of it as analogous to the simple sum rule. The simple sum rule intuitively said that probability turns or into plus if the events are disjoint. The product rule says probability ten turns and into times if the events are independent. Uh, let's see some examples. The events ace and heart are independent. How do we know this? Because knowing that a card is an ace doesn't make it any more or less likely to be a heart. It has no effect on whether, whether or not the card's a heart. Um, let's see if the product rule works. The probability of ace and heart we saw was 1 out of 52 because there was only one ace of hearts. The probability of ace times the probability of hearts is 1 13th times 1 4th, which is 1 out of 52. On the other hand, the events ace and king are not independent. How do I know? Because knowing that a card's an ace makes it less likely to be a king. In fact, makes it impossible to be a king, because ace and king are disjoint. So the probability of ace and king is 0, and that's not equal to the product of the probability of ace times the probability of king. So when they're not independent, the product rule doesn't hold. One more example. If I flip two coins, the event that the first coin is a, comes up ahead and the event that the second coin comes up ahead are independent because one coin doesn't affect the other. Uh, you can see that in the product rule because the product that they both come up heads is 1 out of 4, which is the product of the probability of each one coming up heads. The product rule and independence get used in two very different and complementary ways. On the one hand, in many physical situations like flipping coins, you can recognize from the setup that events have to be independent. And in that case, that allows you to use the product rule to do calculations. On the other hand, in many situations, you want to know if events are independent and you're able to compute the probabilities, you can use the product rule to test whether events are independent or not, and then conclude something about their relationship. We can see that second example if we go back to uh, our Harry Potter example. Here's our table, and let me start by reviewing in this table, what's the probability that someone in the sample is a wizard? So remember, you take the number of wizards, which is 28, divided by the total, which is 100, and you get 28%. What's the probability someone has wizard parents? You do this. There are 10 wizard parents, 100 people, so it's 10%. Okay, what's the probability someone is a wizard with wizard parents? If you think about what that's saying, it's saying they're a wizard and they have wizard parents. Careful here. It's an end, but you can't necessarily use the product rule because we don't have any reason, at least not yet, to think that being a wizard and having wizard parents are independent. However, in this case, we can compute the probability of the end of the conjunction without using independence. That's because we know how many people in this sample are both wizards with wizard parents. There are nine. So the probability of being a wizard with wizard parents is 9 divided by 100, or 9%. Since we can compute the uh, intersection of wizard and wizard parents, we can ask whether these events are independent by asking whether the probability of wizard and wizard parents, which is 9%, is equal 
to the product of the probability of wizard and having wizard parents, which is 0.1 times 0.28, the product is 0.028 or 2.8%, which is not 9%, so we see that they are not independent. In fact, we can say more than, th than that they're not independent. The fact that having wizard, being a wizard and having wizard parents is more likely than you would expect if they were independent suggests that they are positively associated in the language of categorical variables. That being having wizard parents makes you more likely to be a wizard. And of course, those of you who have read or watched Harry Potter should have been expecting this, because it's certainly clear in the Harry Potter world that having wizard parents, either because of heredity or just exposure, makes you more likely to be a wizard. So we're seeing that reflected in the failure of the product rule. Okay, uh, independence is really a special case of something much more general, and it will be very important to us um, because frequently the sample spaces, the probability models we're interested in, come from a sequence of steps, each of which is a probability model. Um, if I draw one card, that's not a very interesting question. There's, there aren't really any interesting questions I can ask about it. But if I draw five cards, a sequence of five cards, and make up a poker hand, then questions about probability become much more complicated, and if you're interested in poker, much more interesting. More to the point, when we pull an individual out of a sample or a population, the probabilities are relatively straightforward. If we take a sample, that's taking a sequence of individuals out of the population, then the probabilities are more interesting and complicated. We will um, represent these sequential probability models by a structure we'll call a tree. So let me illustrate that in a relatively simple example. Suppose you're taking a test with three true-false questions and suppose you're just guessing, so you have a 50% chance of being right, a 50% chance of being wrong, and of course getting one answer right isn't really going to help with the next answer. They're independent. Uh, we're going to model that by representing that your starting point when you open up the test by a little dot on the left-hand side. And now the first thing you do is answer the first question. Two possible outcomes. We're going to represent those outcomes by little crooked lines coming out of that dot or vertex. So there are two. You could get it right or you could get it wrong. So we'll label them C for correct and W for wrong. Um, and we're also going to label them by the probability in each case, 0.5. The two dots on the right now represent the two states you can be in after having taken the first question. You could have gotten it right or wrong. Now you take the second question. Again, there are two possibilities, so we're going to draw two crooked lines from each of these dots. Okay, so we get a total of four crooked lines, again, labeled by their probabilities and what, what they are. Now you have, you could be in four possible states, and now when you answer the third question, we get two crooked lines coming out of each of those to give you eight dots on the right. So those eight dots on the right are the eight possible outcomes of taking the test. But notice, you could think of them as the dots on the right, but you can also represent them by the eight different paths going from this initial starting point to the ending points. Um, and here's the new piece of information. There are eight out outcomes, and the probability of each outcome is given by multiplying the probabilities on that path. What do I mean? Well, the probability of getting all three correct, the, that's the top path on this tree, is the product of the three probabilities, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0 0.5, so it's 1 eighth. Likewise, the probability of getting the first two correct and the next one wrong, 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, which is 1 eighth. In fact, all of these eight things have probability 1 eighth, so we see that in fact, this is a sample space with eight equally likely outcomes. Once you know that, you can figure out anything. So, for example, the chance of getting two out of the three questions right. How can you do that? There are 
three ways of doing that. You can get the first two correct and the last one wrong, or you can get the middle one wrong and the others correct, or the first one wrong and the other two correct. Those are disjoint because these are three separate outcomes. So the probability of getting one or the other or the third is the sum of their probabilities. Each of them we said had probability one-eighth. So the probability of scoring 67% on this test is three-eighths. It may feel to you a bit like this is overkill, like this is a really complicated way of saying that when events are independent, you multiply them, and you're correct. This tree was way more work than was necessary to think about those questions. Um, and let me illustrate that with a, a variation on this. Suppose I told you that there's a one-third chance of rain each day, and that the chance of rain on different days are independent. What's the chance that it would rain on your junior prom and your senior prom and the class picnic? That you have, would have a trifecta of bad luck. Um, so that's an and, one and the other and the third. So those probabilities, because they're independent, use the product rule. We just multiply a third times a third times a third, and we get 127. There was no need to draw a complicated tree there. Where trees get useful is when what's happened before affects the probability of what happens at the next step. So a great example of that is what's the probability that if I draw two cards, there'll be a pair of aces. I'm going to model that probability. You may want to think about that for a moment. I'm guessing this is, this is the first question, probability question we've asked that almost no one can get by intuition, um, but perhaps you can. Uh, we're going to represent that by a sequence where you draw one card, then you draw the other. So when you first draw a card, there's two possible outcomes. You could get an ace, or you could not get an ace. Since there are four aces in a deck of 52 cards, your chance of getting an ace is 4 out of 52, and your chance of not getting an ace is 48 out of 52. Now you draw another card, but now the probability depends on what happened. If the first card was an ace, think about what's left. There are three aces, and there are 51 cards. So now the probability of drawing an ace is 3 out of 51, and by the same token, the probability of not drawing an ace is 48 out of 51. But we don't need to figure that out, because the probability of drawing two aces is the top path, the product of 4 out of 52 and 3 out of 51, which works out to 1 out of 221. And you can see that, that this, the, we really did need to treat these branches separately, because if you had not drawn an ace, your probability of drawing an ace the second time would be different, because now there would be four aces in a deck of 51, and your probability would be four out of 51. I'm going to do one more example. This is a little bit more complicated example. It's more than we're, I'm going to expect you to do in any context, but it's worth seeing both to get the feel of how this works, um, to get the feel of how solving complicated problem goes in probability, and also because this is a really cool thing that, that really runs against people's notion of what should happen. The question is, if I ask everybody in the class their birthday, what's the probability two people will have the same birthday? Um, the answer is much higher than most people think, and let me show you why. First off, let me point out that this is a really complicated question, because if you think about it, how could two people have the same birthday? Well, the first two people I ask could have the same birthday, or the last two people I ask, or the first person I ask and the twentieth person I ask, or there are all kinds of ways that two people can have the same birthday, and if you start thinking about some giant or statement, you see that there's lots of special cases where more than two people have the same birthday that you have to treat separately, or two different pairs of people. It's enormously complicated, but its complement is not. So, as I believe I mentioned before, sometimes you use the complement rule to turn a complicated probability into its complement, which is simpler. So instead of calculating the probability of that directly, we're going to calculate 1 minus the probability of its complement. What's its complement? 
and its complement is everybody in the class has a different birthday. And that, I claim, is much simpler. Why? Well, let's see it as a tree. I ask the first person, what's the chance that everybody I've asked has a different birthday? Well, one, right? There's no, no other option because there's only one person. Um, now I ask the second person. Now there are two possibilities. They could have the same birthday as the first person or not. What's the probability that they don't? That's the only one we need to keep track of. Well, 365 possible birthdays, one of them would be a match. We don't want that one. Presumably they're all equally likely. So it would be 364 out of 365. How about the next person? We only have to consider the case where the first two are already different. So now this person, there's two birthdays they can't have, and 363 they can. So the probability the third person will also be different is 363 out of 365. And the probability, the total probability they'll all be different is going to be the product of those. And you can start to see the pattern. The denominator, we keep multiplying 365. The numerator, we keep multiplying smaller and smaller numbers. What happens with the fourth person? We now have four factors of 365 on the bottom, and we have 365 times 364 times 363 times 362 on the top. And now, without having to go through it or fill out this tree, you can see what will happen in a class of, say, 26. The probability all 26 students have a different birthday is the product on the top of 364 times 300, sorry, 365 times 364, all the way down to 340. That's the 26 numbers in a row. On the bottom, you just multiply 365 26 times, and that works out to 40.2%, which means the probability in a class of 26 that at least two people will have the same birthday is almost 60%, quite likely. Uh, so, a little bit of playing around with your calculator will tell you if it was a class of 20, it would be less than 50%, but not much less. If it was a class, sorry, of 28, it's already almost two-thirds. So it's pretty likely. All right. Let me just run through what you should be able to do. You should be able to use the product rule and tell when events are independent. Those are the only basic skills I can expect you to have right now. With a little bit of practice, you should be able to make and use trees for simple sequential probability models. You should be able to calculate probabilities for sequential probability models where the steps are independent. So that's the sort of easiest case. And you should be able to solve problems that use several of the probability rules. We now have the product rule, the sum rule, and the simple sum rule, and the complement rule. And interesting problems will often require using a few of these in conjunction. And I'll give you some examples of that in class.